So it's raining outside and it's a lazy Sunday afternoon and what I'd like to do is take you through how some of these theoretical tools we've been working with combine together. Uh, you'll see as we go through the video series and as you work with my book Theorizing Education that what I try and do is I try and not only introduce you to the tools but I try and show you how these tools work together until in the end hopefully we can work with all five tools working together analyzing an educational event. Now for this particular case I want to look at Plato's cave allegory and uh, what he does is he he's one of the top educational theorists to actually work with levels and to understand how levels work with education. But at the same time as that, he managed to work with a conceptual integration of enormous elegance and enormous power, so much so that it's become one of the founding stories of how education actually works. So what you can see in front of you is my own picture of it, taken from uh, another picture off the net. And basically I've really simplified it, so please don't assume that this is a pure account of Plato's cave allegory. What you can see in front of you is you can see a, a person, they're in chains, uh, and they're looking forward and they can see the shadow of some kind of a artificial object. In this case I've made it a cross. And then behind that is a fire, and that fire is throwing off strong light, and the light projects past the cross and then throws a shadow on the wall, which the prisoner who's chained up can see. Now by Plato's account, uh, because this is all the prisoners experienced, he takes or she takes those shadows of the cave to be reality. That's the reality that they know. And Plato gives an account where someone else comes down the cave, breaks the chains and enables the person to slowly but surely climb outside of the cave and see what the real world actually is. Now in the process of doing that, the person suddenly sees that it's not shadows that were the real world, or it's not shadows that are the real world. It's artificial object that was throwing the shadow that's more real than the shadow itself. And that to understand that, you need to understand the fire that's actually throwing the um, shadow. So you start to get a, a better understanding of how the world works. Now, as the prisoner climbs out the cave, eventually he gets to a situation where he's standing at the mouth of the cave looking outwards. And Plato gives an account of him being absolutely gobsmacked by this different world, and so much so that he can't actually adjust. And in fact, initially, he has to look at it at night because it's just too awe-inspiring to actually deal with. But he slowly starts to work out that out of there are also the shadow world, and that's the reflections of things on the surface of things. So you can see the way I've tried to catch it is there's a lake there, and in the lake is a, a shadow of a tree. And then beyond that he sees the actual tree, that's a, a real tree. And then above that is the sun, which is giving the light through which all of that can be seen. Now, on the one side that's a pretty literal account of a story of a prisoner in a cave, seeing shadows because of a fire, and then travelling through to the mouth of the cave and seeing reflections of a stream, the actual real objects, and then the sun, which gives the light and the warmth by which everything grows. But for Plato, really, that's just one input space. And what you have to do is you have to understand a second input space, which actually gives a far more educational account of what the meaning behind the story is. So for Plato, there's a first input space, which is a literal version of what's going on. But then there's also a second input space, which gives us a more abstract educational account. And there we've got a division between the everyday world of the cave and shadows and fire and we've got a far more abstract world beyond that, a world which gives us a far more realistic account of how the world works and that comes through the nature of deep principles of the good and the knowledge we have of the world. For Plato is making a simple point. He's saying that the knowledge we develop of the grounding and founding principles of things is far more real and far more lasting than our everyday shifting understandings of things. We're really we caught in uh, imaginings about what the world could be and the famous fake news that we're working with currently. We've got to get out of that space. We've got to get out of that space of popular opinion. And we've got to get into a world of abstraction 
which gives us far more power to understand the world. So what you can see, and all I really want to show you, is, is that we have a situation where Plato is combining uh, the two tools. He's thinking very seriously about how levels operate, but he's also at the same time using conceptual integration to help uh, hold the story together. And finally, just a note that once you're out of the cave and once you've contemplated the abstract world and once you've understood those principles, it's absolutely vital on Plato's terms for you to go back into the cave, to go live in the everyday world, but with abstract principles held tight so that you can navigate the everyday world with intelligence and with vision. And obviously, in terms of the educational act, liberate other people who caught in the shadows so that they can also see the light, they can also see the true nature of reality. So for Plato, there is movement, there's change, there's a situation where you travel outside the cave to the light and then you go back into the cave to go help other people once you've seen the light and then again once you've spent a while in the cave and you start to forget those principles to again travel out to the light again so you can spend some time recovering those principles and you can see the principles of the good more clearly again because otherwise you tend to get corrupted in that everyday world you need some breathing space you need some time you need a chance to live the quiet life where you contemplate the true meaning of life with a community of like-minded people who are also concerned about the good because it's that which gives you the guiding vision by which you can conduct yourself properly in the world and that is the fundamental act of education to liberate people from a world of shadows to take them towards the light so that they can see the principles which deeply inform how we live and then to ensure that people apply those uh, principles back in the everyday world in such a way that when they need a chance again to revive their um, vision and to revive their, their deepest insights, that they have a chance to go back into the light. And so you have a cycle between the everyday world and the abstract world and how you work between them.